Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive your word, written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Today we're going to share with you on understanding the Feast of Pentecost. This is very important to understand. Most Christians have not understood what it is all about. We begin in Acts 2.1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Well, that means when that day came, that's when the day of Pentecost, the fulfillment of this feast occurred. They were all in one on one accord in one place. That's when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. But if we're going to understand about the day of Pentecost, well, what is this all about? We need to go back to Leviticus chapter 23 and talk about the feasts of the Lord. In Leviticus 23, Verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, you should proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. These are God's feasts, not Jewish Old Testament feasts. Verse 4, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you proclaim in their seasons. So, because this is the season, we are proclaiming that. And also, we've been talking about the end-time, mighty, perfected, glorious church, uh, which goes right along with what this is all about. So we're proclaiming this. Remember the first for feast season has Passover, where Jesus became sin on the very day of Passover and fulfillment of it, and then on the cross, and then unleavened bread, where he went down to hell for three days and three nights, paying the price for sin. And then having accomplished the redemption and the firstborn from the dead, Jesus came up, and was the first fruit, the fulfillment of the Feast of First Fruits, of which he went up to heaven, poured out his blood on the mercy seat of heaven. He was the first born from spiritual death into spiritual life. Having fulfilled those first three, then the next feast is the second feast season, which is Pentecost, we'll talk about today. The third feast season is Tabernacles, which is at the seventh Hebrew month, at the end of the year. And this is Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles, which speak of the second coming of Jesus. Well, in speaking about Pentecost, we go over to Leviticus chapter 23 in verse 15. You shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, which was the first fruits, which was done on the morrow after the Sabbath, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, and even to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days. So it was 50 days afterwards. And the number 50 is significant. We will be talking about that in a little bit. And it says you're going to offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Now, 50 days after that, the day of Pentecost, that was the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out. And that's the day when people who were alive on earth could get born again. They, up to that time, it was only Jesus who got born again, and the Old Testament saints who were in the upper compartment of hell that Jesus preached to them, and they got born again, and those were the first ones of the first fruits, Jesus being the first fruit of those first fruits. But now, on the day of Pentecost, people who were alive on earth could be born again with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is what Pentecost uh, be brought forth and began. And he talks about you're going to offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And there's much more about this, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. Later, But first of all, let's look at some of the names that are given for this particular feast. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 10. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God. The Feast of Weeks, well, a week is seven years, or seven days, and so the Feast of Weeks, these seven weeks of days, was 49, plus the one was the 50 days. So it's known as the Feast of Weeks because this is seven weeks in the beginning here, when, um, and then the morrow after that, that is when Pentecost occurred, 50 days later. We also see it has another name, in Exodus chapter 23, 
Exodus chapter 23, verse 16. Here it calls it the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of thy labors. It was the beginning of the harvest of people being born again, harvest of souls, people again alive on earth, could be born from spiritual death unto spiritual life by receiving Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. So it's the beginning of the harvest of the church age. We see another place, Exodus 34. Over in Exodus 34, we pick up in verse 22. He said, you'll observe the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest. Now, in identifying this harvest, the first fruits, it speaks of it as the wheat harvest. And that is significant because there was the barley harvest, which is the early spring harvest. And then there's the wheat harvest, which is the latter spring harvest. The barley referred to the Old Testament saints who were righteous, who were in the upper compartment of hell. Remember, Jesus went and preached to the spirits that were in prison and they got born again. That's the barley harvest. And then the righteous saints. But the wheat harvest was at the end and that was the time of when Pentecost, and so that is what it's talking about, the first fruits of the wheat harvest. This is again the beginning of the church age. It's significant that it shows that this is what this is all about. We see another place over in Numbers, chapter 28, verse 26. And in the day of the first fruits, <coughs> Excuse me. In the day of the first fruits, when you shall bring a new meat offering unto the Lord. Now, this is significant, as you will see. The day of the first fruits means the beginning of this particular day or this period of time, which is the church age, when people get born again now. And notice, he says you're going to bring a new meat offering. <coughs> well, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, because this is an important aspect of what the Feast of Pentecost is all about. So, the day of the first fruits, the beginning of God's work in the church to bring forth the new meat offering that was to be unto the Lord, as you and I are to be an offering unto the Lord, as you will find out. Then we come over to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, as we see here, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord. One place, again, 50 days afterward, what happened? Suddenly there was a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting. That's the Holy Spirit being poured out. Appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues. The Spirit gave them utterance. And we'll be talking about what happened in that situation in those three verses. Now, Historically, we need to understand what this is all about. Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Here we see when the, the Israelites were in the bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh. Exodus 5, 1, afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Well, they were to be let go and go and hold a feast in the wilderness. This was going to be the time of the third month, which was going to be Pentecost, as you will see. Well, of course, would he let them go? No. So what did they have to do? Of course, God brought great judgments against them. And finally, then they let them go, of course. And God delivered them out from Egypt. The Israelites came out. Egypt's a type of the world. Under, from Pharaoh's bondage, Pharaoh's a type of Satan. It's all a type pointing towards how Jesus delivers us from Satan's authority and from bondage to the world. And so, after having been delivered out of that, we come down to Exodus chapter 19. In the third month, now the first month is the time when the first feasts were fulfilled. Passover, unleavened bread, and the feast of first, first fruits. The third month is in the time is, is, is Siwan, which is the, in the 50-day period, 50 days later. 
Siwan, after Siwan Day 6, we have come up now to Siwan Day 7, which was now the time of Pentecost. Third month, and the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt. They came into the wilderness of Sinai. They were departed from Rephidim, came to the desert of Sinai, pitched in the wilderness, where there they camped before the mount. They were going to meet with God, see. And so in verse 3, Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, Tell the children of Israel, You've seen what I did unto the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you'll obey my voice indeed, keep my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now this was significant. As we see, this is what he's speaking to him, but he speaks something important in verse 5 and 6 that couldn't be fulfilled at that time. Notice what he says. He's speaking to all of the children of Israel. If you will obey my voice, verse 5, keep my covenant, you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, all the earth's mine. You'll be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, that's talking about all of them. Who are the priests in the Old Testament era? It was only of the tribe of Levi. Well, could they all be priests into the Old Testament? No. This means there had to be a new day that had come into being with a new covenant in order for all of them to be priests and to become the holy nation. So this is a prophecy which was going to be fulfilled in the New Testament era. We come to verse 7. Moses came and called to the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And the Lord returned the words of the people unto the Lord. That's, of course, what you and I are to do to respond to everything that God says for us to do in the New Covenant, which is what Pentecost brings into being, the New Covenant, remember, for those who are alive. In verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, the people may hear when I speak with thee, believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And then in verse 10 and 11, we see something important. The Lord said to Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Well, Moses is a type of Christ. And this is the time, remember, of Pentecost. And this is when the harvest, of course, of the people who are, not, who are alive, being born again in the church age, begins. But also, notice it says, Moses is going to go into them. Moses is a type of Christ. So this speaks of the type of the work of Jesus Christ in the people. He says, go into the people and sanctify them. That meant that the people during this particular time are to be sanctified, to be consecrated, to be dedicated, to become holy and separate unto him. And he says, today and tomorrow. That's two days. Well, a day is as a thousand years, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. So the two days is speaking of the 2,000 years of the church age. So this is speaking of what happens in the fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost. It is Jesus coming to the people to do a work in them, to sanctify them, consecrate, make them holy, separate, dedicated unto him, in the two-day period of the church age, the 2,000 years. Also, notice what else it says. It's because God's doing this work, but the people have a part to play as well. And let them, that's the people, wash their clothes. Well, the word wash is this particular word, kabas. Kabas is a word which means to perform the work of a fooler. Not a fuller, but a fooler. And the work of a fooler was to wash the garments as clean as possible, get every speck of dirt, anything, all these soil out of it. Anything unclean was supposed to be eliminated out of it. So this is speaking of the people cleansing themselves of all uncleanness out of their clothes, getting their garments free. 
And of course, that's what we're supposed to do. Get rid of all uncleanness out of our life in order to be the people that God expects us to be. And that is important to realize that is the work to be done in fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost during the church age. Verse 11, be ready against the third day. Now, what's the third day? After the two days, the 2,000 days of the, the church age, then we come to the third day, which would be the 1,000-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. For the third day, the Lord will come down on the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. He says he's going to come down there. And we come to, down to verse 14. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people, sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. So this is meaning that this is going to get done during the church age. So after Jesus is doing this work during the church age, sanctifying the people, they respond by washing, cleansing themselves. So this is all prophetic towards at the end of the church age, this having been accomplished. He said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. Verse 16, came to pass on the third day in the morning, there were thunders and lightnings. Thunders and lightnings in Scripture speak of judgments. Because when Jesus, after the 2,000 years is done, which is going to end in 2030 A.D., then he now, because the 6,000 year lease that man had is finished, he is going to take back control over the earth and begin to rule and reign. And so. He's going to begin, as the seals are open, he's going to be pouring out the judgments, thunders and lightnings, the cloud upon the mount, and as the judgments are coming upon the nations, the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so all the people was in the camp trembled. He brought the fourth people out of the camp to meet with God. What's going to happen after these judgments come over the three and a half years? Then he's going to blow that trumpet He's going to bring the people out of the camp to meet with God. Well, that speaks of the rapture of the church, the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. These are the things that are going to happen. So this is all prophetic given here in Exodus chapter 19 of the things that are going to happen. Now let's go back to Acts chapter 1. After Jesus had been raised from the dead, gone back to heaven, then he came back and appeared unto the disciples for 40 days. It says in Acts chapter 1, verse 2, And to the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen to them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus revealed himself for 40 days. He was speaking about the things about the kingdom of God. Then, he says in verse 4, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. That means the promise of the Father has not been sent forth yet, but it's going to happen. What is this about? Verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. This is what happened, what was spoken over, remember, when Jesus was baptized. He talked about what John baptized with water here, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, meaning there's a change in baptism. The baptism with water in the Old Testament era was the first step into the priesthood. Now he's saying there's a new way into the priesthood. And remember the prophecy out of Exodus chapter 19 that they would all be a kingdom of priests. So this is pointing towards, hey, there's something going to change here because we're all going to become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But there's a new way of how we're going to come into the priesthood. John baptized with water. And now it's going to change. You shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. That is how you're going to come into the priesthood. 
and it's going to be a change. It's going to be by the Holy Spirit now, not anything to do with water. And we'll cover this in a moment. We come down to verse 9. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight, and he goes back to heaven. So, Jesus goes up to heaven, and he's inaugurated as the King of kings, Lord of lords, seated at the right hand of the Father, and now he now stays there in heaven, and he is the scepter of his righteousness, the scepter of his kingdom, and he's beginning to be ready to rule and reign. Now, we come to verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. Now that is significant. 120 were in the upper room waiting for this time when this baptism of the Holy Spirit showing a change of how you're going to come into the priesthood was going to occur. It hadn't occurred yet. And so the 120 is the number of the change from one age to another. This is significant. We pointed this out before, but we need to make it clear. The days of man, from the time of when he was given a lease on earth, was 6,000 years. The 6,000 years was that lease period, and then that would be the end of it. Of course, he turned it into the hands of Satan, man did, because of his rebellion against God. <coughs> in Genesis chapter 6, we pick up over in verse 3. He makes a statement here. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. More literally, as Young's brings it out, strive with man to the age. Talking about to the end of the age. What age is that? That's to the end of the age of man's dominion and authority that he was given and delegated to him as a lease over the earth. For that he's also flesh. And, and literally, it says, in their airing, as Young's brings out, literally in the Hebrew, they are flesh. Because he was having to deal with them, and they were, of course, sin, run by sin, and erring continually in the flesh. And here he didn't want, he said, I'm not always going to strive with man to the age. And yet he may, goes on, says yet, but that's not in the Hebrew. It literally simply says, his days shall be 120 years. That's what Young's brings out. His days have been 120 years. Now what are we talking about? Are we talking about the length of man's lifespan? Not so. Abraham lived 175 years. Isaac lived more than that. Several of them lived 130, 140 years. This wasn't talking about the lifespan of man himself. This is talking about the period of time of the age that man had control in the earth. And what was it? It was a 20, 120 years. What kind of years? Jubilee years. Jubilee years were every 50 years. 120 times 50 is 6,000. That was the length of time that man, 6,000 years, had a lease on earth, which he, of course, transferred into the hands of Satan. And Satan began, of course, to rule over the 6,000 year period. So 120, that would be at the end of this, would be the change of that age of man's rule to now where Jesus is going to rule in the 7,000th year period of Earth's history. Well, remember there were 120 in the upper room. Well, that was the change from the Old Testament age to the New Testament age now. It was going to begin the New Testament age where the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, people who were alive on earth could be born again. So that was a change, another age coming into manifestation. We also see about the age, understanding this in scriptures, Second Chronicles chapter 5. This is talking about Solomon's work, uh, Solomon's house that was made and finished for the Lord, the house of the Lord. And Solomon's temple is a type of the church, pointing towards the finished work in the church at the end. It's interesting. Verse 3, 
when all the men of Israel assembled themselves under the king in the feast, which is in the seventh month. The seventh Hebrew month is Tishri, which is the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of the final three feasts of the Lord. And this also typifies, points towards the end time work being done in the church at the end of that age prior to the beginning of millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Well, we come down to verse 11. It says, came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for the priests that were present were sanctified. <coughs> All the priests were to be sanctified, then did wait by course. Verse 12, the Levites, which were, but were, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, Asaph and Hedlin and Jedlin, and their sons and brethren being arrayed in white linen. White linen speaks of righteousness. Having psalteries, cymbals, psalteries, harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. There we have this 120 again. This is talking about at the end of the seventh month period, which is prophetic of the end of the church age, right at the end of that time before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so what do we see? This is speaking of the church, Solomon's temple, type of the church, finished work, done. They're sanctified, as we see in verse 11. They become arrayed in white linen, that is righteousness, we come to verse 13. Came even to pass the trumpeters and singers were as one. Remember, Jesus prayed that we would become one, would become one. To make one sound to be heard in praising, thanking the Lord. And they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. Well, that's the end time church, remember, at the end of the seventh month. This is the, what's going to happen to the end time, mighty, perfected, glorious church. They're going to be filled with a cloud. Verse 14, So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. That is prophetic, of the glory of God going to fill the end time church. So, we're going to see this end-time, mighty, perfected, glorious church, and this is what Pentecost is really about. It's not just the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we get born again, we get our prayer language, and operate in the power of God, that's all part of it, as you will see. But it's also the work being accomplished throughout the church age to bring the church to be the mighty, perfected, glorious, holy, righteous church. This is what God is going to have. Now, after Jesus has gone back to heaven, we mentioned this, but let's look at this. In Hebrews chapter 1, after the 40 days, verse 8 of Hebrews 1, Under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Jesus, now seated at the right hand of the Father, was now going to begin to rule and to reign. And what did he then do? Acts chapter 2, verse 33, is very significant. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, so now he's seated there at the right hand of the Father, and having received Lombano, taken, of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. In other words, in order to fulfill the Feast of Pentecost, Jesus had to go back to heaven, be seated at the right hand of the Father, receive from the Father the Holy Spirit, and then send him into the earth because Jesus had to get the Holy Spirit from the Father. Now this brings us to the place of understanding what actually happened on the day of Pentecost? Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord, one place. 
Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting. What is this sound, the rushing mighty wind filling the house? That's the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit came in to your house where you are or came into this building right now and filled this place where we are, then that would have, that's exactly what would happen. A rushing mighty wind would fill the place where we are at. What would that mean? That means we would be immersed, submerged, engulfed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is what baptism means. Remember, Jesus said, you've been baptized, John baptized you with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Baptism, we must understand what that word means. We come back there. Baptize is a word which means to immerse, submerge, or engulf in something. So, they were immersed, submerged, and engulfed in the presence of the Holy Spirit at that point in time. That's exactly what the picture we see in verse 2, that filled all the house where they were sitting. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And remember, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was going to bring them into the priesthood. How do we come into the priesthood? Well, how did Jesus come into the priesthood? He was born spiritually from death unto life and born into the priesthood. How do you and I become into the priesthood? Same way. We are born again from spiritual death unto spiritual life to come into the priesthood. What is that? That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth that brings us into the body of Christ. Look at the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Notice, baptized, this is this word, baptizo, immerse, submerge, engulf in into one body, and it's by one Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. So the baptism by the Holy Spirit, where we're immersed, submerged, engulfed in the presence of the Holy Spirit, brings us into the body, which is what? That's when we get born again and become born, come into the body of Jesus Christ, having received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. We are born again. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the new birth. Have people understood this in the church world? No. They haven't understood this at all. In fact, we have a tremendous conflict about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what brought us into being born again. If I took a pail of water, I took my hand, stuck my hand down in the water, my hand would be in the water, it would be immersed, submerged, engulfed in the water. The water could have an influence upon it, but the water doesn't get into my hand. Well, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we are immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. It influences us, but it doesn't get into us at that time. The Holy Spirit does not come into us at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What happens? The old spirit is taken out and a brand new spirit comes into us. We understand this when we see in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. If when we were enemies we were reconciled by God to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, which means we came into relationship with him, and how? By the change or the exchange where we get a brand new spirit on the inside of us. We're saved by his life. This is speaking of us coming into relationship with him by receiving Jesus. Look at verse 11. Not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received, lambano, the atonement, which is this word, kalage, which means the exchange. What exchange? The old spirit is taken out, and a brand new spirit comes on the inside of us. We see the same thing brought forth over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. 
old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. That speaks of the new birth. We go to verse 18. All things are of God who hath reconciled, this is this word, katalaso, the change or the exchange, same word, us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of the reconciliation, which is the exchange. What happens when we get born again? The old spirit is taken out, a new spirit comes in. What spirit do we get? We get the spirit of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. What did he send into us so that we were sons? He sent forth the spirit of his son. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's the spirit of Christ, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We even see Scripture stated over in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. The latter part of this verse says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. The whole Spirit of Christ comes from Jesus. That's what we receive when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. We get born again. That's how we come into relationship with him. So what do we get when we're born again? We get the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's go back to Acts chapter 2 now. In Acts chapter 2, we saw what happened in verse 2. Baptism of the Holy Spirit filled the place where they were. Verse 3. There appeared unto him cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Well, here this speaks of the cloven tongues like as a fire. That's the Holy Spirit coming upon each of them. This is the receiving of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in a person. We know this over in Acts chapter 19. Paul was addressing this issue when he, verse 1 says, came to pass when Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. He said to them, have you received, not been baptized, he said, have you received? This is the Greek word lambano, which means to take into yourself. The Holy Ghost, since you believed. Well, that meant they were believers. What do we get when we're believers? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. We're born again. And he's asking them, well, you're a believer. Now you're born again. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you taken the Holy Spirit into you since you believe? Showing the fact that the receiving of the Holy Spirit is after we are born again. They said to him, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Well, down in verse 6, when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, just like the whole, that cloven tongues came on them, sat on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So this is when the Holy Spirit came into them. In like manner, that's exactly what happened when it says that the cloven tongues like as a fire had sat upon each of them. This is the receiving of the Holy Spirit, and that is the correct term for the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell on the inside of us. Now, we can see this clearly when we look at other things that we see from the Word of God. So let's look at John chapter 14. We pick up over in verse 16. Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he, that's talking about the Father, shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. So where does the comforter, who's the Holy Spirit, come from? It comes from the Father. He, the Father, didn't come from Jesus, came from the Father. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot lambano, receive. 
That means that the Holy Spirit cannot be received by the world. What does the world receive? Well, they receive Jesus and get born again and get in the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit cannot be received by someone until they're born again, because the world can't receive the Holy Spirit. You've got to have a new spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, first, before you can receive the Holy Spirit. We also come down to verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Notice, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. So who does it come from? The Father. The Holy Spirit doesn't come from Jesus. It comes from the Father. Well, we can see this even clearer, more clearly, over in chapter 15. Look at verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you, you say, well, I thought Jesus didn't send him. He does send him, but not from himself, because he didn't have him to send him from himself. Look what it goes on and says. Whom I will send unto you from the Father. He got the Holy Spirit from the Father. The chain of command goes from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. So Jesus received the fa from the Father the Holy Spirit, even the Spirit of Truth, and this makes it very clear where the Holy Spirit comes from, which proceedeth from the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. It does not proceed from Jesus. When you receive Jesus, you get a brand new spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. You receive that from the Father after you are born again. That is important to understand. The scripture we looked at just a little bit ago, but let's look at it again to show this clearly. Acts 2.33 Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and had, having received of the Father... Jesus got it from the Father. The promise of the Holy Ghost he has shed forth is what you now see and hear. So Jesus didn't have the Holy Spirit to send and he got it from the Father. It proceeds from the Father. That is important. We can even also see about the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, verse 13. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. They got born again in whom also after that you believe, after you were born again and got the Spirit of Jesus Christ, after you believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What is it? It's a promise. Who has a promise? Only those who are in covenant relationship with God. How do you come into covenant relationship with God? By being born again. Therefore, the Holy Spirit, which is a promise, is a part of our covenant right a promise of God once we've come into covenant relationship with him after we're born again. He goes on and says, which is the earnest or the first fruit of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So the Holy Spirit is a promise and he's also part of our inheritance. Another thing you must realize, remember it doesn't come from Jesus. The Holy Spirit is received from the Father. Luke chapter 11 verse 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your Father, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Notice, your Heavenly Father give. So who gives the Holy Spirit? The Heavenly Father, not Jesus. That shows you the fact that the Holy Spirit is received after we are born again. Furthermore, didn't, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say how much more shall God give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. No, it's your Heavenly Father. So who's the one approaching God for the Holy Spirit? It's the one who approaches Him as His Heavenly Father, meaning the person asking is a born-again believer with a relationship to God as His Heavenly Father. He's a child of God. He's born again. 
So the born-again believer with the Spirit of Christ is going to ask the Heavenly Father to give the Holy Spirit, showing you the fact that it comes to those after they are born again. That is so important for you to understand. Let's look at one other scripture. Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, we see in verse 5, talking about Philip. Acts 8, 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. The people with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. We come up to verse 12. When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized both men and women. This is after they'd been born again, and this is a baptism with water. There is a water baptism, which is showing forth what happened on the inside of us. So these guys were born again. Did they have the Holy Spirit yet? No. How do we know? Verse 14. When the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive. Lombano, same Greek word, Lombano, receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Notice, these guys were born again. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 16 again. He, for yet he was fallen upon none of them. Then they laid their hands on him and they received the Holy Ghost. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is subsequent to salvation. It is correctly called receiving the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell on us on the inside of us. Now, another thing we need to look at is, is we've seen the, how the Holy Spirit came, and what he accomplished. We go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Once you have the Holy Spirit within you, you have the ability to pray in tongues. It is a spiritual prayer language. And it brings a filling of the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. That is to be an ongoing thing, and we'll be talking about that uh, later on. Now, in getting back to what the Feast of Pentecost is all about, we need to understand, remember, it was 50 days. And what was 50? 50 is that jubilee number, the number of jubilee 50, every 50 years. And what does jubilee signify? And we go back over to Leviticus, chapter 25. We pick up over here in verse 8. It talks about the number of the Sabbaths of years of 49 years. And verse 9, Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, and the day of atonement. You make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. This is after the 50 days. You shall hallow the 50th year. And proclaim, after the 50 years, proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. You should return every man unto his possession. You should return every man unto his family. Every man went free from the bondages. He was restored. So this speaks of restoration of what has been lost. Jubilee is a coming to liberty, freedom, being delivered, being restored, Return possessions, debts were canceled, everybody was returned back, and they were free. It was all about liberty. A jubilee shall be that 50th year, be unto you, you shall not sow, neither reap or grow itself uh, until the grapes have been the vine undressed. It's the jubilee, it'll be holy unto you, and you eat the increase thereof out of the field. So the jubilee was all about coming to the place of freedom. Verse 13, in the year of the Jubilee, you return every man unto his possession. Well, after 50 days, so that means there's going to be some effect of a Jubilee occurring beginning at the time of Pentecost, which is what? Liberty. What did Jesus do? Well, when he came and brought forth the redemption, 
he also came and brought forth liberty. We see in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, cover the bright sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. <clears throat> this is the year of Jubilee, the year of going free from bondages, deliverance, restoration, healing, all of these things. This is when Jesus began his ministry. When did he begin his ministry? He began his ministry actually when he came on the scene to, first of all, to bring that forth, the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews. And then, of course, this continues on by the Holy Spirit in the church age. And what do we see throughout the church age? We see the casting out of the demons, the healing of the sick, the setting of free from bondages and liberty throughout the church age, which is what the Jubilee is all about. Meaning now the fact that the Jubilee, showing the ministry of Jesus, began to be carried out among all the people who were alive in the New Testament age who were born again from then on through the 2,000 years seeing them be set free, delivered, healed, restored, come to the place of being of, of, of total liberty and victory in their life. And that's what Jesus brings forth. Now this brings us to something else. Understanding about the Feast of Pentecost. Because we go back to Levit Leviticus chapter 23, and we saw, beginning in verse 15, it's speaking about this time of the Feast of Weeks, but also the time of which is the Feast of Pentecost fulfillment. Verse 16, unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you'll number 50 days. So that's the 50 days up to the time of Pentecost. Notice, he says, you shall offer a new meat offering. A new meat offering. New means brand new. This is a particular word which means a brand new, a new thing. Well, that's what happens. What happened on the day of Pentecost? All the people who were alive then could, who received Jesus could get born again. They got born again receiving Jesus now. So brand new people, new creation came into being. Now we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And he speaks that you're going to offer this new, not just a new creation, but a new meat offering. It's interesting when it talks about this meat offering. This is the word minka in the Hebrew. Minka is an offering or a present being brought from an inferior to a superior. And who is supposed to be, you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So this is something that we are to do. So what's this talking about? This is talking about us giving ourselves as an inferior to a superior unto the Lord as a new meat offering. It's not just getting the Holy Spirit in you, you know, getting born again, having the Holy Spirit, being able to speak in tongues, and see this victory and freedom and liberty, which is all part of what the Pentecost is all about. But also, it's more than that. It's you offering yourself as a brand new offering unto God. You give of yourself. This is all part of the fulfillment of the feast of Pentecost, of what it's all about. So we are to give of ourself to God in service unto Him. In fact, we know in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, over in 50, verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live, who are born again, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Well, if we are going to live unto him, that means we're going to give of ourselves unto him. We give ourselves unto him. That's what the minka is. You and I, being born again, remember, we're purchased possession. 
We're not our own any longer. We belong to him. We're bought with a price. And what is our response to be? We're to offer a new offering, minka, unto the Lord, which means you're to offer yourself unto the Lord. You're to be given unto the Lord. I mean, think about it. In Romans, it speaks of this. Chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, making yourself an offering, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We're to present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy. That's all part of what Pentecost is all about. We go back to Leviticus. Chapter 23, as we saw in verse 16, the new mob offering to the Lord. And then we come to verse 17. He says, You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Again, this is an offering that we're bringing unto the Lord. Well, who's all supposed to be this offering? It was supposed to be everybody who was born again. And notice it said two wave lows. Well, the wave was that up and down motion showing the fact that now we've come to relationship with him. And who are the two wave lows? It speaks of the Jew and the Gentile that are to be born again because the gospel came for everybody. Otherwise, now everybody is supposed to be now born again. Remember there's now as we see over in Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 14, look what it says. He's our peace who hath made both one. Talking about Jew and Gentile, both one. He broken down the middle wall partition between us. So the two wave ones are now all as one. It's been broken down having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain of the two, Jew and Gentile, one new man. Otherwise, everybody is now, there's only one. There aren't two. There's one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity therein. And we see... Again, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Again, it's all emphasizing the fact that the two have become one. And remember, there is a change now in actually who is a Jew. Romans chapter 2, verse 28. He is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. And that's been eliminated. Neither is that circumcision which is outward of the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, because the change is on the inside. Circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letters. Praise is not of men, but of God. Meaning, who are the now the spiritual Jews? Those who are born again. And that would include Jew and or Gentile. Remember, they've broken down the middle wall partition. There isn't one any longer. Now let's go back over to, so, for, so he's talking about bringing all of these into this one body. And that's exactly what we all come into. Leviticus chapter 23. We'll go back to verse 17. And he talks about the two tenths deals. The word here for tenth is the word that's normally translated the tenth part or the tithe. And what is the tithe, or the tenth part? It is also known in Scripture as the first fruit. Because what are we now? We're the two wave lobes of the two first fruits joined together. They're now, we are now a first fruit unto God. Now, all of us are. In fact, that's how we get born again and to be first fruits. And, of course, this is what's happened on the day of Pentecost for all those that are alive Remember, we even see 
the statement made in James 1.18, of his own will begot he. This means given birth to. Of his own will he gave birth to us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures or creation. And that's exactly what's happened. So we now are the first fruits unto God. So what he's talking about here, back in Leviticus, as far as the fulfillment of what the Feast of Pentecost is about, he talks about now these two wave loaves, Jews and Gentiles, they're now the two first fruits unto God. And we are to be given ourselves unto God, the minka. They shall be a fine flower, he says. Now that means a work's supposed to be done. Fine flour is the result of wheat that is ground down and crushed to become fine flour, so it's suitable to become bread. Well, that's what happens with us. And this working of being crushed to fine flour and being worked it to become bread speaks of the testings and provings that will come in a person's life to come to the place of being that fine flour being made unto the bread of God which is what you and I are to come to. We must understand, Jesus, not only did he come to bring forth the new birth, we get, brand, we get the spirit of Jesus Christ, now we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, there's more to Pentecost than that. Jesus now is coming into us to accomplish a great work. In John chapter 6, look what it says about him in verse 33. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So the bread of God is a person, and that's Jesus. You and I are to become as the bread of God. Well, how does Jesus come to us? Through the Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we pick up in verse 17. For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Who's the bread? Jesus. Who's the one bread? We'll become one with Jesus, the one body. How does this happen? Because we become partakers of that one bread. And how do we become partakers of that one bread? Through the bread of God, the word of God, coming into us to accomplish this great work. We see a scripture over in Exodus chapter 29. It says, This is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister me in the priest's office. Remember these guys came into the priest's office, and part of this is you and I are to be priests in a holy nation to God. They took the one young bullock and two rams without blemish, unleavened bre cakes, bre unleavened bread, cakes unleavened, tempered with oil, and wavers unleavened, anointed with oil, of wheaten flour. Thou shalt make them the wheaten flour. Well, that's what we talked about. We talked about this fine flour from the wheat. <coughs> now, when he says wheaten, this is the wheat. Well. Remember, the barley is the Jews, the wheat is the, talking about from the time on, from Pentecost on. So this is talking about the church age people who are born again. Of wheat and flour shalt thou make them. And what is this all about? These are talking about those who could be involved in ministering in the priesthood. They had to be unleavened. They had to be wheat and flour. They had to be made into being able to be used of God. Well, that's what God is doing through the Word of God in you and in me. We also see Numbers, chapter 6, verse 13. This is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He shall offer his offering unto the Lord. One he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering. One ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering. One ram without blemish for the peace offerings. There's the burnt offering. Jesus paying the price for sin. Uh, and uh, new birth, the sin offering. Putting away of all the sin. The peace offerings, which 
really speaks of the fact that now we've come into peace with God through all the work that Jesus accomplished. A basket of unleavened bread, ah, become unleavened. Cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, well, that means it's been beaten together, this fine flour. Wavers of the unleavened bread anointed with oil, or meat offering, meat offering, that's the minka, giving of ourselves unto him. And the drink offering, the drink offering was where we pour out in service. Drink offering was the pouring out of service. So this all speaks of the fact that the Nazarite, which you and I are spiritual Nazarites, in order to be used of the Lord, we become as a spiritual Nazarite, dedicated, consecrated, holy unto the Lord. We see the total work of Jesus accomplished in our life, bringing us to the place of being born again, conquering all sin, having peace with God, uh, being one who now given of ourself to him as an inferior into a superior, and pouring ourselves out as the drink offering in service unto the Lord. Otherwise, you're not your own. You're now to be yielded totally to the Lord and to see him accomplish his work in your life. It goes on and it says after the, being, or the fine flour, verse 17, they should be baked with leaven. Well, what's the leaven about? You were to be unleavened. Well, what's the leaven in the New Testament era? You and I still have bodies that are not changed. Our body has sin dwelling in it. It is leaven. So the baked, this, be a, this work of bringing us to the place of being this holy church, this perfected, glorious church, consecrated, dedicated unto the Lord, offering ourselves in service unto the Lord, pouring ourselves out, is in the midst of us having leaven in a body that's got sin dwelling in it. Remember, that's why we're supposed to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, and not let sin have dominion over us any longer. These are the first fruits unto the Lord. This is what you and I are to be. We are to be a first fruit offered unto the Lord. Come to verse 18. You'll offer with the bread, the seven lambs without blemish of the first year, one young bullock, one two rams, a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering, their drink offerings, the offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. So again, this is talking about all the things that Jesus accomplished, his sacrifice for sin, and the fact that now we've been born again and we offer ourselves as a meat offering unto God and a drink offering, which is a sweet savor to the Lord as we received him and been born again. We put away sin, we're holy, we're consecrated, we're dedicated to him. We're a spiritual Nazarite now. We're walking in the ways of the Lord. We're righteous before Him. Uh, we're holy before Him. We deal with all sin areas in our life. He goes on and says, Shall I sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering, two lambs of the one year for a sacrifice of the peace offerings? That means sin being dealt with. And the peace offerings, which speaks really of all the, the promises of God that God has for us. All the things that he's brought forth, having peace with God now, we come into covenant relationship with him. And then verse 20, the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for the wave offering before the Lord and the two lambs, and they shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. Notice, the bread of the first fruits, which is what you and I are, from having been born again and seeing the work of the bread of God in us, to make us the fine flower, to bring us on to grow up to maturity to be perf and to perfection. We're to be holy unto the Lord. Holy unto the Lord. This is all part of what the Feast of Pentecost is about. It is you and I, the work of God being done by means of the Holy Spirit who performs the Word through the Word of God, the bread of God coming into us that we come to the place of being holy before him. And by the way, verse 21 goes on and says, you should proclaim on the selfsame day, it may be an holy convocation unto you, you shall do no servile work therein, it shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. So the proclaiming this work being done, and notice, it said, you do no servile work therein, meaning you can't accomplish this by yourself. Who does the work? God does the work. 
But how does God do the work? Through us obeying what he says. Remember, Moses said he's going to come down and he's going to sanctify the people. That's God's work in us. We do have a part to play because remember, what were the people to do? Wash their clothes clean. Get rid of all the uncleanness. Get rid of it all. Be ready for the third day. This speaks of the church age, the 2,000 years. And this now is getting us ready for what is going to happen. Because after the 2,000 years, the church age is done. Remember, 4,000 years until Christ accomplished the, the re redemption and we were raised from spiritual death into spiritual life. And then 2,000 years of the church age, which we're less than 10 years away. It ends in 2030 AD. At that point in time, that's when Jesus will begin to take back the authority and the, to rule and reign as he opens up the seals of the title deed to the earth and begins to pour out the judgments upon the nations and at the same time deals with the Jews in the last three and a half years for them to come to the place of, of getting saved and then, then, of course, he's going to catch up the church to meet the Lord in the air in fulfillment of trumpets. And then we go back to heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then after that, we come back for the judgment that will come upon the nations, the Day of Atonement, the judgment. And then the millennial reign of Jesus Christ will begin where he will reign from Jerusalem here physically on earth during that thousand year millennial reign. This is what's going to happen. But you must understand, Pentecost is not just an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, get born again, get the Holy Spirit, get your prayer language, and about healing and deliverance only. It's a total work of God to bring us to the place of being holy unto the Lord. And this is a work that he does in us as you and I obey the word of God and see him accomplish. It is all done in the new covenant because it's a new day. It's a brand new day, new creation. On the, we're now all a kingdom of priests. We all are building our spiritual house. We all have come into relationship with him. And now sin has no dominion over us. We have authority. We cast out demons. We heal the sick. We destroy the works of the enemy. We walk in the ways of the Lord, possess promises, overcome same time, we see the work of God accomplished to consec be consecrated, to be dedicated, to be holy unto him and to give ourselves unto him and to be giving ourselves in service unto the Lord. These are all the things that we see are the fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation of the Feast of Pentecost and the mighty work that you're accomplished. I thank you for the church understanding the fullness of the Feast of Pentecost, what it's all about, and how this fulfillment of this work is being accomplished by the Lord in the church during this church age, and is to be accomplished before the end here, at the end of the next 10 years. Father, we thank you that as this is accomplished, you will bring forth the mighty, perfected, glorious church ready for the manifestation of Jesus taking back the, the rule and the reign over the earth and bringing forth the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Father, we rejoice in this great work. We thank you for accomplishing in every one of us as we are hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.